Okay, it has been too long, and we still have so many types to do in this series, but today we are attempting a hardcore Nuzlocke in Pokemon Ultra Sun using only shiny flying types. In a hardcore Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's gone forever. I can only catch one Pokemon per area. I can't level up past the next challenge. I can't use items in battle, and I play the entire game on set mode. If you're new to this series, hi, I've made it my goal to beat a monotype hardcore Nuzlocke with every single type using only shiny Pokemon. We've trekked our way through a few of these so far, but this one is special to me. I really like flying types because offensively they're pretty great and it's honestly just a top 5 type for me. But I'm a bit worried about their defensive capabilities. You see, like I said, flying spam is a really great strategy when you're on the offense, but defensively they can kind of fall short. Still, there is absolutely an insane variety of flying types in the Alola games and I'm stoked to see what we can do with them. Also, this run has one of the most insane endings I think I've ever experienced since I started doing doing hardcore Nuzlocke's, so you're going to want to stick around for that. If you enjoy these videos, please remember to leave a like because that helps out a ton with the algorithm and if you're new here, consider subscribing. My short term goal is to hit 69k because I think it's a funny number and I would love to hit 100k before next year, so if you enjoy what I do, please help me out with that goal. Okay, no more wasting time, let's get into this. There is actually a flying starter in these games, so we have to do our first shiny hunt by soft resetting, which I absolutely loathe, but thankfully it goes by pretty quickly and we find our shiny Rowlet in a reasonable amount of time. You should know that I've boosted the odds of shiny Pokemon in these games because I really want to beat it before Pokemon Ultra Scarlet and Ultra Violet 2 are announced. I name Rowlet Bushroot and as always I have a theme for my nicknames. If you think you know it, leave your guess in the comments down below. This one might hit you right in the nostalgia if you're the right age for it. We do some intro nonsense that involves saving Lily and her little bag goblin, both of whom are not really important until much later in the game, but we still have to save them from some Spiro on a bridge. Now we can catch our our first new team member so I find a shiny picky peck, catch him and name him Launchpad. I have high hopes for this Pokemon because I feel like Toucanon is a little underrated and also this one happens to have the skill link ability which I think is pretty neat. Also it's a woodpecker that evolves into a toucan and that's just natural selection at work I think. After doing some more tedious intro nonsense we are finally kind of set free and our mom gives us a little spending cash which turns out to be 35k which is so much more than you get at the beginning of the game in earlier generations. It's comical. Inflation is really hitting the Alola region hard. We then find and catch a shiny Wingull that I name Liquidator and I am stoked because this dumb little bird has hydration, meaning when it evolves into a toilet it will have drizzle. I know that you can just farm Mantine Surfing for an ability capsule, but it'll be nice to use those points for something else. After a meeting with Professor Kukui, he gives us a Pokedex that is clearly using some kind of stimulant and we are ushered into the Pokemon school where we mop the floor with some nerds and then also their principal. I don't think I've ever lost a Pokemon to her ever. Do not go back and watch all my videos to fact check that statement though. With the trainer school crushed, we finally head to our first big city and face our first big challenge, deciding on an outfit. I go with this little number because I'm pretty sure if I didn't, 50% of the comments would be about how I wasn't properly representing Team Sky for this run, so now I'm hoping that I can farm even more Team Sky comments. Don't let me down. After that, we have to fight Illima, and this fight can sometimes be tricky because Smeargle hits deceptively hard thanks to Technician, but with some cleverly placed Orin Berries from the trainer school, School, Launchpad is able to get a workup off and rock smash through his muskrat and then pick up a hit on the smear goal, letting Liquidator in and finish off the Walmart Picasso with a wing attack. With that win, we unlock the first real trial, but also a ton of encounters, so buckle up. In the Howley Cemetery, we catch a shiny Drifloon. I went with the Ghost Balloon over Murkrow because I like it better and for zero statistical reasons whatsoever. I guess an immunity to fighting a normal could come in handy later, but really, I just like the balloon. I named him Quackerjack. On Route 2, I catch a shiny Spearow, mostly to unlock the encounter that I really want for Route 3. I name him Hammerhead, and in some cave off of the Mantine surfing beach that I always forget about, I catch a shiny Zubat and name her Morgana. Zubat is always an interesting encounter because it's absolutely terrible early, but if you can hang on long enough for it to evolve into a Crobat, it will absolutely put in work in your run, so I'm stoked for that later. Now, with a full team of six, we head into the Verdant Catacombs for our first trial. As a side note, I end the level caps as soon as a trial starts. It doesn't come up in this trial specifically, but it might might come up later and I don't want to have to remember it down the line. So let's just get it out of the way now. So we fight our way through the cave and then just as we're about to swipe our first Z crystal, this big ass muskrat falls out of the sky and attacks us. Now look, I've already done a bit in another video about this dude looking like Trump, so I'm not going to make the same joke again. Let's just get the laugh out of the way right now and move on with the indictment. Yeah, I know, I mean the battle. I lead off with Liquidator into this oversized wombat and start off the battle by using a growl to lower its attack stat as it sets up a scary face to lower my speed. It calls in 
an angry gerbil at the end of the turn and since liquidator is still at full health i stay in tanking a tackle to around half and an odor sleuth before getting off another growl to drop the pair of chinchillas attack stats even further i switch into quackerjack on the next turn who gets in completely for free on a pair of tackles and from here i think a strategy of minimizing is smart but the bigger ferret eventually lands a bite which takes quackerjack down to close to half and i realize this should probably never have been plan a so i go to switch and the smaller ferret actually catches me with the pursuit which i didn't even remember it had quackerjack is a boss though and lives on one hp but still the drama in the moment was pretty intense maybe you had to be there i don't know i bring out morgana and just get the larger capybara confused with a supersonic before switching into launchpad who is able to knock out the smaller weasel with a brick break and gets the larger one down into the yellow with a pair of brick breaks finally i switch back into quackerjack for free on a tackle and he's able to outspeed and pick up the ko with a gust winning us our first island trial with a pretty convincing team effort i misplayed a little bit here by trying to set up minimize but you know you live and you learn with that trial down i unlock two new encounters the first of which is a shiny noibat that i catch and named gosselin and the second is the pokemon that i completely expect to carry for a large portion of the early game a shiny halucha i catch him and name him darkwing because i really feel like he has main character energy also just a quick aside the halucha hunt took basically my entire life i do play with the game sped up but my playtime after finally catching the halucha is over 27 hours which roughly translates to 14 hours of real time which is insane for how early on in this game we are i'm also able to catch one of my favorite alolan pokemon or a choreo shortly after and i name her binky next up we have some story nonsense where we have to save lily's bag goblin because periodically throughout this game she just lets it get away and while we're doing that we have to fight some aliens and then how but we crush all of this and as a bonus launchpad evolves from a woodpecker into a bird that is completely unrecognizable in the real world and now it's time for the real fight of melee melee island kahuna hala now hala is the first big boss you fight in the alola games and kahunas are insanely strong because of their access to z moves they can be really difficult to plan for and muscle through sometimes this is not one of those times though i lead off with launchpad and plug just one shots hala's first two pokemon only taking a fake out from makuhita and it's not enough to one bang his boxing crab and the cabrawler does manage to get a fighting z move off but launchpad really steps up to the plate and lives on one hp and ko's it on the next turn i probably should have switched into zubat here because her type is nuts for this fight but it all worked out in the end that is two narrow survives on one hp already though which is definitely concerning to me after crushing hollow we can now ride on a bull for some reason so i loot the rest of the island for goods including stealing a full brunch buffet of leftovers from these wild munchlaxes or is the plural munchlaxes or is it just munchlax unclear i was an art major words are for nerds then we go surf on some mantine which i always spend way too much time doing because these points are super valuable and also i'm the best mantine surfer and literally never fall ever don't fact check that we then make our way to akala island where we're challenged by some b team characters from pokemon x and y and i'm not gonna lie i thought i was straight up about to wipe to this espion because i picked drifloon over murkrow but somehow binky clutches the fight since i'm able to orchestrate switching in on a quick attack after basically my entire team had been dropped to under half from psybeams the combination of roosts and air cutters just barely squeaks out the fight and once again my defensive capabilities with this team are looking a little shoddy bushroot evolves into dartrix as a bonus after the fight and for this run this this will be his final form since Decidueye loses its flying type in favor of a ghost type when it evolves. We fight Howe in the next town, but we'll skip this fight for time. His team is trash right now and we just out damage him at every step. I always do this super random side quest in Pinolia Ranch where you have to help calm a Tauros down because it's upsidey spaghetti for no reason. And I do it every run because it unlocks the scope lens, which I think can be a pretty useful item early on. Critical hits are great when they're yours and this item combines with several moves and abilities to give a 50 to 100% critical hit chance and that's a strategy that I love, landing critical hits. So anyway, Trumbeak critical hits this Tauros with Brick Break and it doesn't kill, but it does trigger Tauros's ability Anger Point, which gives it a plus six boost to its attack stat. That's the equivalent of three sword stances, all because I landed a crit while trying to get an item that would increase my chances of landing critical hits. I don't know if you know this, but Tauros is already pretty strong and he's also fast as fuck for the early game. So Trumbeak dies on the next turn to a pursuit which means switching into Drifloon wouldn't have helped at all here and then Halucha comes out and is thankfully able to outspeed and land a karate chop to take the bull out had I missed the karate chop this almost certainly would have been a wipe but hey I got my scope lens at least so you know 
Silver Linings. We can now head to the next trial, but we're stopped by Gladion, who is what Hot Topic would look like as a Pokemon character. I don't have the patience to narrate this fight right now since we just lost our Woodpecker Toucan hybrid buddy, but in short, Darkwing pops off here. Absolutely crushes Gladion. Now the next trial requires us to chase some silly goofy fish and water bugs, but then we're attacked by a not so silly or goofy giant ass water bug in the rain. This trial is normally pretty tough since as stated, it takes place in the rain, which is just a permanent damage boost for water type attacks, but thankfully, we have a bunch of birds and other winged creatures. I lead off with Darkwing and get a strong aerial ace off on the first turn, but take a bubble down to just above half as the water spider calls in a Masquerain, which is the worst SOS partner it could have called in here. Since Darkwing has his attack lowered, I switch into Binky who is immune to an incoming stun spore and doesn't take much from a bubble. Back to back air cutters land and are enough to drop the Masquerain on the first turn and then the giant ass water spider and its little water spider friend that it called in with the second one making this the easiest water trial I have ever done. The trials on Akala Island are all kind of back to back to back, but beating this one actually unlocks a good bit of content to me. I can now make my way to Wella Volcano Park where I find a shiny fletchling that I named Fem Appeal, and then I head all the way back to Melee Melee Island, and with Lapras unlocked, I'm able to surf around and find a key piece for the next trial, Shiny Remoraid. I catch her and name her Not A Bird. You're probably saying something to the effect of, hey, that's not a bird, and it doesn't evolve into one either, and yeah, did you see the nickname, then I hunt for my real target, Shiny Mantike. I find her, catch her, and name her Neptunia. And hopefully, you figured it out by now. But if you didn't know, you need a Remoraid in your party for Mantike to evolve. So I level up Neptunia, and she evolves into Mantine, which is honestly really strong for this part of the game. Did I need to find the Remoraid Shiny? No, but I was feeling kind of spicy in the moment, so I did it anyway. After that, both Morgana and Hammerhead evolve into Golbat and Fero, respectively, and now it's time for Kiawe's trial. I always get a little nervous for this one because in my electric monotype run from over a year ago, I wiped here an asinine number of times, but this time, I'm feeling good about my odds. I lead off with Morgana into the Walmart Ghost Rider and set up a rain dance on the first turn which halves the damage from the incoming flame wheel. Marowak calls in Salazzle, but in the rain no attack should kill, so I confuse the Salazzle with Confuse Ray and take another soft flame wheel. Then I switch into Neptunia taking a glancing flame burst in flame wheel, and this Mantine actually has Swift Swim which is bonkers here since it lets me outpace an Oko the seductive lizard on the next turn with a bubble beam as the Marowak detects. And then a few bubble beams are able to clean up the fight and drown the Marowak for an easy trial, which I think is the first time I've ever said that about this specific fight. So that's also a win. Bonus points for the birds here. Also, Morgana levels up at the end of the fight and evolves into Crobat, so this is really just a win 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 all around. Before the next trial, I level Fem up and evolve her into Fletchender because a fire flying type could theoretically crush the grass type trial. And speaking of the grass type trial, it's right right now. We lead off with Morgana into a souped up Lorantis and I keep clicking cross poison into it but this infuriating comfey that it calls in keeps boosting Lorantis's defense stat with flower shield which is I'm sure a move I've never seen in my life. This is made worse because the Lorantis keeps using synthesis to heal up and I only get one critical hit that does not kill from full and I never get a poison. So somehow I end up in a situation where my crowbat is unable to 1v1 this grass type which is a ridiculous sentence. I mean maybe she could in the long run, but eventually I make the decision to Merc the Comfey, which was also a mistake. You see, Kecleon comes in and this Pokemon has Dizzy Punch, which can confuse, and no Screech to lower my team's defense stat. So after some switching to shrug off confusions or stat drops, I end up in with Binky, who is kinda low, but I am positive I will be able to outpace and finally KO Lorantis, so I stay in and go for an air cutter, but the plant manages to outspeed and snuffs out my lovely little cheerleader bird with a solar blade, which is just really upsetting because all of this is probably my fault for not waiting or being patient, but it's also just incredibly annoying. Eventually, the combination of Morgana and Darkwing are able to finish off the fight by brute force since the oversized weed runs out of synthesis PP, but I really didn't have to lose Binky here. It was just a bad play on my part. I never even got to change her type, which is just so unfort. So with that trial out of the way, Liquidator can finally evolve into Pelipper, so he now knows Drizzle, which is a fantastic combo with our swift swimming Mantine. We head to the Dimensional Research Lab because some story stuff happens here, but really, the only reason I ever include this clip is for the shot of the sky Ussy. You're welcome, or I'm sorry, I guess it depends on how bad you think this joke is. We make our way to the grand trial of Akala Island, but are ambushed by Plumeria, and I never show this fight, so you know someone dies. 
Yep, there he goes. Hammerhead just bites the dust to a goal bat. I think I expected too much from Firo here. Have a good rest, buddy. Now it's time for the Olivia fight, and I could bore you with a play-by-play, -play, but essentially Liquidator leads and just drowns her Anorith, and then Darkwing comes in and sets up a few home claws and mercs the rest of her team with a couple of brick breaks. It's very exciting for me because I won, but it's not the best battle to narrate, so we just crush Olivia, steal her magical stone, and move on. This is the part of the game where we go to Aether Paradise for the first time, and it gives us serious creepy vibes and also we have to fight an ultra beast in the Hiligo but I guess I forgot to record that footage or I just lost it so just enjoy this picture of the Aether Paradise and then we'll head to Ula Ula Island. Here we have to battle Hao in the first rival fight where he has an actually good team since his Eevee has now evolved, his Pikachu has now evolved and he has a Tauros but the only real threat here is Alolan Raichu. Thankfully with an Eeveeolite Bushroot is able to take its electric type attacks and take it out with a few Giga Drains that keep him healthy enough to not faint. The rest of the fight is pretty simple type advantage and then just knocking out a dinky little Noibat. Quackerjack is finally able to evolve into Driftblim and hopefully contribute something meaningful to the team because Quackerjack's done almost nothing except use its normal type immunity in the first trial. And then we go on a massive catching spree, hunting for and catching a shiny Skarmory that I named Steelbeak, a shiny Minior that I named Negaduck, a shiny Ledian that I named Herb, and a shiny Masquerine that I named Cerebellum. The next trial is the electric one and I do not have a solid plan for it, so I decided to just catch everything I could and try to make something work. So we head to Mount Wanahakalugi and honestly I probably should have done some theory crafting before starting this run to see if this fight was even possible but I think I've come up with the best strategy I can. So I challenge uh, this dweeb to his trial. I cannot remember his name for the life of me and I'm not looking it up because I'm trying to power through the script here. So he's just the dweeb. So I lead off with Sarah into the Totem Togedemaru just to get a turn one intimidate and I immediately switch into Quackerjack as the metal rat uses spiky shield which is a pretty solid turn turn one for us. On the next turn, I'm hoping Togedemaru goes for a Zing Zap, and I'm pretty sure the Skarmory it calls in will just Tailwind since the AI likes speed control, and the turn goes exactly as planned. Thankfully, Quackerjack doesn't flinch and lands a Spike, taking away four of Zing Zap's PP, leaving it with just five Zaps left. I switch back into Sarah predicting a Spiky Shield, and we call this turn correctly as well, getting another Intimidate drop for basically free. But the Skarmory does set up Stealth Rocks, meaning I won't be able to just keep switching in and out all willy-nilly anymore. I stay in with Sarah, tank a Zing Zap, and get a Scary face off which should be incredibly useful and then protect on the next turn stalling another zing zap pp i switch back into quackerjack and live a zing zap after stealth rocks and a protect on the next turn lets him get some passive leftovers recovery and eat up another zing pp then zing zap grabs a flinch on the following turn but that should be its last pp so from here we're kind of in the clear i switch into herb and stealth rocks may do a ton but i'm able to roost back up and set up a reflect which will reduce any incoming damage i bring in fem afterwards who also takes a ton from stealth rocks but takes nothing from skarm or to Togedemaru's attacks. So I'm able to snag a flame body burn on the Skarmory, putting it on a timer, and some general stalling happens, and eventually I switch into Darkwing, set up some home claws, and just brute force my way through the rest of this battle. This battle was terrifying, because I'm pretty sure without landing that initial spite, I would have been washed. Also, next time I would bring Defog on something, because playing around Stealth Rocks was terrible. Anyway, it was a weird strategy, but it worked out, and I'm glad it did, because wiping right now would absolutely break me as a human. We now have to confront Guzma in the garden, but as a bug type trainer, I should have to spell this one out too much. We swat him down. After that, I realize I can just become a Hariyama, and as far as I know, Hariyamas don't pay taxes, so this is where the video ends because not paying taxes or having other financial responsibilities is tight. Thank you for watching. Okay, just kidding. I guess I'm still a human who has to pay taxes and has responsibilities, so let's finish the video. Fim can finally evolve into Talonflame with our newest level cap, which is fantastic. I know this bird is normally seen as pretty offensive, but since it has Flame Body, I've been Eevee training it and raising it to be a little more defensive, which I think is working out well. Now it's time for the first trial where the Totem Pokemon gets an Omni Boost, and of all Pokemon, it's Mimikyu, who also gets a free substitute at the beginning of the battle. So just unideal circumstances all the way around. The fight starts with me leading Sarah again for the Intimidate drop on the ragdoll and I switch into steel beak on the first turn for the defensive typing and I think going for a strategy of iron defense setup will be solid here but the bonnet that has been called in immediately shuts that down by using curse so I spend the next few turns pivoting around between Sarah and Fem, racking up intimidate drops and forcing play roughs into my firebird until eventually the Mimikyu burns itself twice with flame body it had to be twice because of the lumbar it was holding and from here it's just a waiting game really so I switch into Morgana and start stalling through turns and getting in for chip damage when I can until the wannabe Pikachu falls, and then Minior comes out to clean up the Bennett. This fight can be really spooky, 
pun intended, but Intimidate plus a burn meant Mimikyu could never really break through, and it really helps that we dodge Shadow Claw crits as well, because those will also ruin your day. Now some story stuff happens, so we have to fight Plumeria again, but we steamroller this time, and I guess this was a distraction so that Team Skull could steal a Muskrat. We now have to infiltrate their base to get the Muskrat back, which we do, but I guess this was also a distraction inside of a distraction, because we infiltrate the base, crush Guzma again, return the Muskrat, and return to find that while we were gone, Plumeria came back and kidnapped Lily. Since I'm told we care about her and we have to go save her to progress the story, we gather our team and head to Aether Paradise, which, surprise, is where she's being held. By her mother, which makes me wonder if this even really counts as kidnapping. You know what? It's probably better if we don't think about it and try to make it make sense. Before we actually head to Aether Paradise, we have to fight the Kahuna of Ula Ula Island, this sad uncle who lived out his glory days in the mid-2000s emo scene, and I'm not gonna lie to you, two of this dude's Pokemon have Fake Out, and Darkwing is fast as hell and has Encore. So I Encore the Sableye into Fake Out and pick it off, I Encore the Alolan Persian into Fake Out and pick it off, and then switch into Sarah on this Crocorock, and a single Bug Buzz is enough to pick it off. So we win the fight pretty easily. Some people might say Encore is broken because the AI will literally never play around it, and to those people I say, yeah, you are absolutely correct. It is a fantastic move to use in Nuzlocke. And with that win, we only have one more island to conquer, but now we have to go save Lisa. And no, no, no. Or is it Lily? There it is. So the Aether Paradise is a pretty big gauntlet of tough trainers, and some of them happen back to back with no interruption. We trudge slowly but surely through the Aether Paradise goons and eventually make our way to Guzma for a third time. I lead off with Sarah into his Galissapod and send it packing with emergency exit on the first turn with an air slash. Guzma sends in his pincer, and knowing this beetle has Stone Edge, I bring out Darkwing, and by roosting to get rid of my flying type and healing up, I'm able to stall out all of the Stone Edge PP, which lets me go into Negaduck, set up a Shell Smash, and end up at 5 HP so that I'm in my shields down form. And from here, we crush the rest of Guzma's team with Power Gem. I really wish this Pokemon was better competitively because I think it's a really fun playstyle. It just never works out the way you want it to. But it did here, and that's what matters right now. I heal my team up and head into the encounter with Lusamine, and I've learned that this specific fight's difficulty is almost always determined by how dog water Lusamine's AI wants to be. So here, let me give you an example of that. Morgana poisons her Clefable to death pretty easily. I pick it around to Sarah and Femme on her beware getting it intimidated and burned, and then Herb of all Pokemon is able to take it out with a couple of air slashes coupled with burn damage. Herlopony is a joke, sorry Purplecliff, Darkwing just obliterates it. Then Hermilotic comes in, and instead of doing anything that makes sense, it goes for a Dragon Pulse on Darkwing where a Hydro Pump would have killed. I mean, I assumed I would still outspeed after the Icy Wind speed drop, so I'll take the garbage AI here because I almost lost the main character of the run, but plot armor prevailed once again, I guess. Lilligant is also a joke because I have two Pokemon on my team that quad resists its attacks, but even when I don't have resistances, it normally just teeter dances over and over and over again. So Lusamine gets her pipe smoked, and she could have actually robbed me of a really good Pokemon. She then jumps into an alternate dimension inhabited by demons, and now we can go to the final island, so there's progress. With the level cap increase, Gosselin can finally do something in the game and evolves into Noivern, which is a massive buff to the team at just the right time. You see, we have to traverse the vast Pony Canyon now, and most of the trainers in here are skippable if you pay attention to your movements, but at the end there is this group of three trainers who are required fights. I legitimately think this might be one of the toughest stretches of required fights in a game that are just random trainers. You have Ace Trainer Hiroshi who has an Alolan Graveler that can just explode and a Lapras, Veteran Heather with a Talonflame, Wailord and Glaceon, and finally Veteran Eric who has a Noctowl, Gengar, Slowking, and Flygon. All of these trainers have good AI, their teams have good type diversity, and a few even have gotcha gimmicks like Glaceon's Mirror Coat and Noctel setting up a Tailwind or Reflect. All of the Pokemon except Graveler are level 48 and your level cap here is 49. So not only is this a difficult section to get through, you have to manage your experience through it. In my fight with Veteran Heather, I leave Negaduck in against her Glaceon assuming a Shell Smash boosted Power Gym will kill, and it does not, so in return, I lose them to a Frost Breath that will always crit. It was honestly just my fault for not running a Calc here, learn from my mistake, and do not take these trainers on blind if you are planning to do a hardcore Nuzlocke of these games. This stretch is very difficult. Okay, so with that gauntlet of trainers out of the way, it's time for the penultimate island trial, Coma O. This dude also gets an Omni Boost, has insane coverage, and has two really good partners he can call in. So this fight will not be easy. I lead with Sarah because I want the Intimidate drop, and I actually stay in and go for an Air Slash, but Sarah takes a ton from a Thunder Punch, and Air Slash is just barely a tap, which is not fantastic for the home team. Coma O calls in Noivern, and I switch into Steelbeak, who absolutely chews on a Dragon Claw and Air Slash. On the next turn, 
turn I resort to my inner stall player and just toxic the samurai dragon before ultimately switching out into Morgana because of a screech harshly dropping Skarmory's defense stat. Morgana also switches in on a screech though so I'm forced to double switch here and at this point I think I've gotten all the mileage out of Masquerain that I can so I make the tough decision to go into Sarah for another intimidate drop and she falls to a thunder punch. You did good little bug, you really did. Quackerjack comes out and stalls for a turn with protect to rack up toxic damage and then after taking a thunder punch and a dragon pulse Hex finally drops the coma O. With just Noivern left I switch into steel beak and basically stall the fight away with a combination of toxic damage, roost and fly for chip damage. Not the most elegant totem coma O fight and I hate that I had to sacrifice Sarah here but I don't think she would have ever been an elite 4 team member and we got the dub so it wasn't in vain. Now we have to ascend an astronomical amount of stairs, learn to play a flute in just a few minutes and start a jam band with Lisa so her little cosmic nugget can evolve into a massive cosmic lion. Then we watch as the portal to the demon dimension from earlier opens and a black prism demon follows Lusamine out of it and then fights and eats our new cosmic lion. This also summons some weird creatures including a budget Pennywise all across the Alola region. It's just a really chaotic five minutes. We have to fight Dustmane Necrozma because of course we do but its AI is set to dog water much like Lusamine's was. So it just keeps using its signature attack over and over again into Fem even though she very obviously resists it and we're able to melt the line with some flamethrowers. Now unfortunately the cosmic lion demon hybrid jumps into a portal back to its own dimension and somehow this sucks all of the light out of the Alola region and maybe the world, who knows, but we do know that the sun is kind of important so naturally I have to go save the world, but first we need a new team member. I've been saving this one for a while because from the moment we started the run I knew it was my best out to Ultra Necrozma so I trade a plume fossil over, save in front of this gentleman's RV and reset my game until he gives me a shiny dino bird thing that I named Stegmut. I think this is all I need but actually it is not. You see in this game revived fossils come at level 15 and by then it has already lost the one move I needed to have which is quick attack. So I decided to do something I've never done in one of these runs and that is head back to Mount Wanahakalugi, catch a ditto, and put both of these Pokemon into the daycare and actually breed and hatch eggs until I receive a level 1 shiny dino bird thing that I named Stegmut Jr. I've never once shiny hunted via eggs and I hope I never have to again, but the move relearner isn't unlocked until right before the Elite Four and I don't think I had another out to this next fight. So there's a first time for everything. Stegmut evolves into Archaeops and with a few moveset adjustments my Ultra Necrozma Killer 5000 is complete. I head to the Ultra Megalopolis ready to in this whole Pokemon's career, watch it mega evolve or some other mechanic that I'm not really sure of and then I challenge it. I lead off with Stegmut who would instantly die to the incoming power gym if he wasn't holding a focus sash, but instead he lives on a single HP meaning an Endeavor drops Necrozmamon battle mode to 1 HP as well and a follow up quick attack is able to grab the KO. I've never once fought this Pokemon straight up and I don't know that I ever will. It's 10 levels above our level cap right now and it gets an insane double omni boost before the fight on top of already insane stats. So I make sure before every run that there is one Pokemon who can cheese this thing because that feels important to me. Anyway, we saved the world and now we can get on with more important issues like finishing the game. I do the Mina trial next and it starts off simple enough with a normal battle, but then I am tasked with going around all of Alola region and fighting every trial captain over again to get a bunch of flower petals. And I normally just skip this part so you know something bad is going to happen and yep. There it is. Stillbeak dies during my fight with the dweeb from earlier because I didn't realize his Alolan Golem was holding a Z Crystal, which is just poor planning on my part and also insulting. Stillbeak was a big part of the Elite Four team and also my plan B versus the very next totem fight. He was just the best defensive piece that I have so this one feels extra bad. I make my way back to Mina, really upset about my loss and now I have to fight her totem or Bombi. This Pokemon also gets a double Omni boost at the beginning of the battle and is known for setting up quiver dances. So I lead off with Stegmut Jr and on the first turn it just attacks which basically never happens. It always sets up. This drops Stegmut to well under half meaning defeatist kicks in and my stone edge that lands and crits because I'm holding a scope lens to have a 50% critical hit chance does not KO this bug. Blissey is called in so I switch into Fem who is able to barely take two helping hand boosted dazzling gleams and finish the bug off with an acrobatics. Darkwing is able to switch in and easily clean up the Blissey meaning even 
even though things did not go as planned, we still managed to pull out a deathless trial, which is actually pretty rad. Our final test is a fight with Hapu, who has a level cap lower than Rabombi's, something that has just always bugged me. We lead off with Pelipper, who is able to set up the rain and easily deal with Hapu's Golurk and Flygon. Neptunia comes out next and drowns her Mudsdale, and then making his last appearance of the run, Bushroot gets to show up and deal with Hapu's Gastrodon. And it feels kind of nice that our starter, who we could never fully evolve, still gets to do something at the end of the game. With that, we've beaten Hapu, and now it's time for the end game. We have to fight Gladian one last time, but we kind of crush his team with the only tense moment coming from having to decide if his Silvali was actually a Silvali or an Illusion Zoroark about to use its Targ Z move. We get the coin flip right, mostly because I think he's always programmed to use Silvali last, and we're able to live the Black Hole Eclipse with Darkwing and finish off his team with ease. So now, it's actually time for the Elite Four. I spent some time tweaking EV spreads and movesets, and I decided to leave Bushroot, Herb, Neptunia, and Quackerjack behind, meaning my team for the Elite Four will be Stegmut Jr., Darkwing, Fem Appeal, Morgan, and Gosselin. I know there are several flying types I could have gone and hunted for that I have not yet, like a shiny Gyarados, Salamence, or Aerodactyl, but I wanted to do this without the obvious broken first two Pokemon, and I actually think Stegmut's move diversity is better here than Aerodactyl's would be, even if its ability can be an insane liability. So with the final preparations done, we head in. Now two of these Elite Four members are very obviously way harder for my team to deal with, and those are Malene and Olivia, so I'll save them for last and hopefully allow the experience share to kind of work its magic in the meantime. I start off my Elite Four run by challenging Acerola, and Stegmut is able to easily crunch his way through her Banette, Frostlass, and Delmise, forcing her into her Palisand. This is her Ace, and it's almost always guaranteed to use its Z-move, but thanks to the invulnerable turn granted to us by Fly, we're able to completely dodge all of that damage from Z Shadow Ball and get some good chip off on the Sandcastle in return. Morgana is able to finish it off with Air Slashes, and then after encoring her final Pokemon Drift Blim into a status move, I'm able to switch Stegmut back in and finish off the fight. So an easy first elite four member fight to start us off with, which is always great. Kahili is next, so I once again lead off with Stegmut, but my Stone Edge misses on the first turn and her Braviary harshly lowers my speed with a scary face. On the next turn, a critical hit Brave Bird drops Stegmut to low yellow, meaning my follow-up Stone Edge doesn't even kill, which is a massive bummer. I switch into Fem as Kahili heals up her bird, and the combination of a Will-O-Wisp burn and alternating roosts with attacks is enough to take out Braviary without taking too much damage bringing in Mandibuzz. I burn the buzzard as well, and then in a really odd line of thought, I decide to switch into Darkwing and start setting up bulk ups. This actually works out phenomenally, since the defense boost plus Roost can keep him healthy. This means a Halucha, the one Pokemon I didn't plan on using in this fight, is able to sweep the flying type elite four member with acrobatics after his citrus berry gets consumed, winning us the battle and sending us to one of the harder fights against Malene. It's difficult to understand how I should navigate this fight, but I forget to rearrange my team anyway and accidentally lead off with Stegmud into his Clef Key. I'm not too pressed about it because predicting a Thunder Wave, I switch into Darkwing, who can't be paralyzed because of his Limber ability, and on the next turn, I Encore the Clef Key into Thunder Wave, and in a moment of utter shock, the AI switches out into Magnezone as I start trying to set up bulk ups. This is not good. I do not have a great switch into Magnezone, and honestly, I was hoping to at least grab a few KOs before it came out, but now we're in a tough spot. I switch into Goslin because she is neutral to Thunderbolt, and Roost shenanigans should let me stall out its PP, but of course the Thunderbolt gets the 10% paralysis, meaning Goslin is essentially useless in this fight. I go for a flamethrower, but once again, of course the first turn full para happens and Goslin goes down. In this moment, I don't have a single option to one-shot this Pokemon since it has sturdy, so I bring Darkwing out and get off a brick break, but a follow-up Thunderbolt is way more than enough to KO in return, dropping our hero. I guess the plot armor doesn't work in the last act of the movie. Thankfully, Femipil is able to come in and pick off the magnets, and then by somehow landing every single Will-O-Wisp and roosting over and over again to stay healthy after using Flare Blitzes, she's able to pick off the rest of Moline's team. If he had a single Pokemon with a Rock-type move, I think we would be cooked here. Speaking of Rock-types, I just lost my only Pokemon neutral to that type, and our next Elite Four member is Olivia, the Rock-type member. Maybe I should have picked Fem as the sack there, but I don't think I win without her being able to burn Moline's team. I don't know, it's a really tough call. The Thunderbolt hacks and then the full paralysis hacks kind of spiraled the fight, so who knows if I'll even be able to beat the Elite Four from here, but I'm going to try. I challenge Olivia and lead off with Liquidator, who while normally a slow Pokemon, is able to outspeed every single member of Olivia's team with just a little bit of speed in 
investment. Scald in the Rain easily drops the Armaldo on the first turn, bringing out Gigalith who sets up the Sand. Knowing I probably can't win this battle without my Pelipper, I switch into Morgana hoping for a Stone Edge miss, but we do not get the 20% dodge and Morgana just goes down. Honestly, this is a really unceremonious end for such a staple Pokemon throughout the run. Pelipper comes back out, setting up the Rain again, and another Scald drops the Gigalith, forcing Olivia into her Ace, Lycanroc. This Pokemon also drowns in a single hit, and then she sends out Probopass, which is probably my biggest obstacle for winning this fight. I stay in and go for a Scald, which does well over half, but the Living Mustache sets up a manual Sandstorm, which is not good for us. I try a follow-up Scald on the next turn, hoping we can spike a critical hit or a burn, but the loss of the Rain Boost plus the Special Defense Boost Probopass gets from the Sand is enough for it to live in the red, and it lands a Thunder Wave, meaning we are in a really tough spot. I switch into Stegmat on the next turn, predicting Olivia to heal, which she does, so we get in for free. A Bulldoze does well over half, and a Power Gem isn't enough to drop us under half, so we're able to take the Probo Pass out on the next turn. Cradilly is Olivia's last Pokemon, and despite using Roost to heal up over and over, the plant eventually drops Stegmut's speed enough with Rock Tombs that I am forced to switch back out into Liquidator. On his first turn out, the Cradilly gives us a free turn by using Stealth Rocks, but it is immediately taken away from us because we get fully paralyzed. Pelipper barely lives an Energy Ball on the next turn and lands a Hurricane, which manages to confuse. On the next turn, Turn, Olivia uses a full heal, not a full restore, so one more hurricane might be able to steal the deal, but we get fully paralyzed again. An energy ball on the next turn drops Liquidator out of the sky, so I send out Fem, hoping a Brave Bird will be enough to grab the KO, and it is. So we've beaten the Elite Four, but I have two Pokemon remaining. I'm down to just Stegmut Jr. and Fem Appeal. I'm not gonna lie, I went into the tank hard here for over an hour trying to decide if it was even worth taking on Hal, or if I could even come up with a strategy strategy to win. His team is incredible, but he only has one flying resist in Alolan Raichu. I've kept Stegmut alive this long because he should always outspeed Hal's Raichu from level 59 and on, and Crunch should always one-shot. From there, I just have to be able to get enough damage on the Pokemon good against Fem to get her in and hopefully set up. While theory crafting, I keep hitting a hurdle at his Primarina, but then it hits me. I don't ban Z-moves in these runs, I just normally don't use them because I favor healing items like Leftovers or other more versatile options, but Z Stone Edge could actually get the job done here depending on what order Hao sends his Pokemon out in and also depending on a slight damage roll. Either way, it's time to try and win this hardcore Nuzlocke by beating Hao's well-rounded team of six with just the two birds that I have left. We're challenged by Hao and I lead off with Stegmud into his Raichu and just as calced, we outspeed and a crunch on the first turn is enough for the KO. Hao sends in Kerbomitable so I click fly and after the charge up turn it lands taking the Yeti Crab out. Out. Primarina comes out next, and this is the Pokemon that kept hardwalling me in calcs, but we power up our Continental Crush Z-Move, and it is enough to one-shot the Siren Otter, meaning we've taken down half of Hao's team with just one Pokemon. Tauros comes out next, so I switch into Fem Appeal on the predicted Iron Head, and she absolutely snacks on the hit. A Will-O-Wisp on the next turn connects, so from here, I start bulking up and roosting, letting Fem's HP drop to the point where she eats her Citrus Berry, and we are able to just set up in front of this bull. One Acrobatics connects and drops the Tauros. How sends in Noivern, which will always outspeed me, but from full, Dragon Pulse leaves me in the yellow, and a second Acrobatics takes out the Bat Dragon. Flareon comes out next, and only a critical hit quick attack should be able to take Fem out from here, but Flareon doesn't even go for it, probably opting to go for a charm to harshly lower our boosted attack stat, and a third Acrobatics takes it out, meaning with just two Pokemon left alive, we won the Bat battle and the run. This was honestly a whirlwind of a run. I lost a ton of Pokemon in this one because like I said at the beginning, birds are frail. But figuring out that champion battle and being able to beat the run with only two Pokemon left, yeah, that's a high I'm going to be riding for a while. Let me know what Pokemon you think was the MVP of this run and also let me know what challenges you would like to see in the future. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for all the support on these videos. If you enjoyed this, please remember to leave a like and also subscribe if you want to help me out on my way to 100k. I'm Vivid, I'm kind of done here, but I will see you all again very soon. Bye.